Okay, Lynn, whenever you want to start, take it away. Sure. Okay. Um, so it sounds like we all had very lively discussions with some, some, some um, real interesting places where I think there were some real convergences um, in, in some of the tools, but, but in exciting ways, also some synergies around some of the main points that were made and recommendations um, across the, the different breakouts. And so what we're going to do now is, is um, and, and I think the notes are being, um, are, are being emailed, distributed to the, the full group, but I, I may have that wrong. Um, we can ask that they, they can be. Say again, Leslie? We can ask that they be emailed to everyone, but my, but yeah. the way this session will work is the science, writers will sh uh, science writer will share the screen. They're sharing the screen. We just said, we'd suggested that the notes go out and I think maybe if they went out more broadly, that, that could be useful. Um, okay. So it, it to, but to have a pretty short um, uh, presentation from each of the leads so we can really maximize the time we have remaining in discussing uh, uh, some of these provocative ideas that really have been brought forward, how we would flesh those in uh, more at where the gaps and synergies are and, and how, again, that might recommend really particular steps. So um, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna actually ask Kathy Bradley to start, if you, if you can, if you have things in front of you there. Um, I think that you've got some, there were some pretty broad based recommendations from that group that I think might feed the, the discussion or, or, or build a good framework um, for the subsequent presentation. Oh, can you, I see nothing. So I have nothing in front of me, but I can do it from memory oh. if you want that. Are, are we gonna get that, the notes on the screen? Sorry, Kathy, I'm not able to share screen. It says host disabled participant screen sharing. Maybe the host could fix that, Dave. <laughs> I just started uh -huh. to look at that. Yeah. Um, can we get that just on one one page, please? So that just push it down onto a page so we don't have all that page break and we can see the bullets below. We just want to be able to see the mission, vision from the vision down to the bullets that are on the next page, please. Okay, let me let me insert a page. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So um, thanks. We have three really different bullets. So let, let me frame it like that. And, and Lynn, three minutes, right, is what I'm doing here. Maybe take a couple more if, it's, if it helps you flush it out. I think it's fine. Okay. Um, the very, the top priority was a, oh, I just lost it somehow. Oh, well. Oh. Can we, can we get that back that Notes oh. again for folks to see on screen. They were there and then they So the very just talk. Um the very biggest was for a research a pain substance use mental health research network that would make it as a, a very early that and the network would be different from existing networks that would include vulnerable populations and they are for one of the early orders of business would be implementation research to implement pain, substance use, and mental health measures into those health systems, had the measures we needed to then do effectiveness, pragmatic implementation research in that work with real people um, and addressing the spectrum. Within that bullet, in the end, bulleted a whole bunch of research on specific topics, including, and I'll just call it out, um, studying buprenorphine used more broad. I know that's an area of another group, um, but, but we did the design of the trials and we can go back to that in a second, but I'll give you our, our other areas of priority. Number two was disparities. And by this, we mean just studying underserved populations, racial, ethnic, um, minority but also vulnerable populations. Um, we 
this rather than making it a cross cut like it has been bold in so many ways for so long and that the way that the intersection between disparities, health disparities, and stigma and issues in particular are going to get addressed is to, to um, address it as a real issue. We talked about the importance of the workforce, uh, disparities in the workforce, or the lack of, of underrepresented minorities in particular um, being important there. But so that was called out as one of our three major priorities. The third priority is multiple component interventions and these are interventions that will um, care for people over time so building on um, another group talked about step care but also over chronic care models essentially that as people have life and health events that um, their needs in terms of their pain mental health since use um, so for our three big buckets um, a uh, and the, the mega one is really the research network that measure the things we measure and at, with, I should say, pragmatic clinical measures that clinicians want to use, because that's the only way they're going to ever be there. The next one is, in some ways, around and um, mental health heard uh, multiple component interventions. Um, we had a number of cross-cutting issues. One was implementation research that needs to be baked in, even if it's an efficacy trial, from my opinion, um, but from the start. So designing for implementation. Um, prevention is a cross-cutting issue. Is a huge cross-cutting issue. These cross-cutting issues um, need to be baked in all the way through all three of the other ones. And then we had one that I'm forgetting since we don't have our notes. Um, somebody from my group to remember. At least I'm not noting our notes. That's it. Pass on to somebody else. Oh, prevention of what? Thank you. Um, Shelly asked prevention of what? Um, prevention of ad. You know, we, we talked about this. I don't think it got into the, the end, but we talked about about I think harm reduction was that was one I think prevention related to harm reduction that was a theme that and I was gonna say we talked about prevention as a broader which is harm reduction and honestly it can be everything from harm reduction at the point that opioids are first prescribed to harm reduction of treatments so that we're using view in patients with high risk for overdose or adverse effects of um, we're, we're testing bup in those populations, not just um, people with craving, but people with high suicidality. So it's it's broadly writ as harm reduction. That's a thank you for that. I think that's it. Pass to okay. somebody else. Yeah, that's terrific. And I, I also wanted folks to know. I don't know. I there were some pieces of what Kathy said I could hear well. I think I'm having some technical issues, so um, I might have others fill in a little bit. But one of the things I heard there are really some important emphasis on cross, uh, you know, cross-cutting themes uh, across all of these domains, and and how this kind of network is an infrastructure and building these measures into the clinical care settings, as well as this focus on stigma, could could really uh, create the foundation for doing these studies more broadly. Lynn, um, do I need to so, say something? I got, I got feedback from a lot of people I was cutting out, and it might be that I was looking down. Um, do you want me to go back over one or two of those bullets that, that people missed? I, or couldn't, I, I could not bullets? hear. Yeah, I couldn't hear what you were saying about stigma as well. That was the place where you were going more in and okay. out with me. So maybe you could just repeat that. Yeah, I think I was looking down trying to remember them. So the, 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 we had a number of cross-cutting issues. And we'll, that and then we, the conceptualization of cross-cutting issues is that there are things that need to be baked into the fabric of this research. So implementation research um, taken into account at the design phase, whether or not it is an effectiveness study or a pragmatic trial or, or implementation research. Stigma reduction 
um, at every stage um, baked into the design. And so I'm envisioning um, RFAs that call out, you know, the same way PCORI calls out patient involvement, which we should probably have on this list, um, we would call out stigma reduction and, and addressing how at every stage so that you, uh, you, uh, you attract people to thinking about this stuff. Um, and improving the research of diversity, uh, the, the diversity of research team, and then harm reduction, which is what we should have said instead of prevention. That came Can I just you. make a really right. quick note to everyone? We're interested in receiving your scientific input on content. I would really caution the group to stay away from talking about RFAs, review, thank you, all of that. Okay, thanks. Appreciate it. Great. Appreciate that reader. Thanks, Shelly. Okay, um, Eric, can I go to you next uh, to to summarize your group discussion and main and and main takeaways? Sure. So our our conversation started, and I think this is an important. Uh, frame that we don't know if there is a synergy of chronic pain and OUD that is greater than the sum of its parts. So we, we certainly know a lot about chronic pain as a field, and we certainly know a lot about the treatment of addiction, but it may be that when these two things come together, that there are emergent properties or mechanisms that need to be addressed. And if so, then we may need new interventions to, to address that, that, that which is greater than the sum of its parts. So <clears throat> given that frame, uh, we, we called for research on a precision medicine approach that uh, number one is built upon understanding the multiple endophenotypes that present as the spectrum of chronic pain and, and opioid misuse or mild OUD all the way to severe OUD. Um, a precision medicine approach that's number two, paying attention to mechanisms of change and number three, that the end, the end product of this precision medicine uh, research program would lead to <clears throat> novel multi-component models of multidisciplinary stepped care. And so, th so those were our, our three kind of broad areas, but uh, special consideration should be given to, first of all, using holistic endpoints that integrate pain relief, well-being, and function, along with the reduction of opioid use and misuse. And this research should also give special consideration to uh, engagement-related factors, stigma, disparities, and barriers that, that affect not only the individual level, but also that reverberate on the organizational, regulatory, and payer level to impact the implementation of these models of care. And so our vision, if this research program is successfully implemented, is providing multimodal care for engaged patients, providing the right treatment to the right person that works for all people equitably, regardless of socioeconomic or racial status, and care that will, that's going to be paid for by society. So hope I hope I did that justice. <clears throat> Great, thank you. Um, I think that 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 was a, a, a great and concise summary, and um, it, it's uh, complemented and and broadened some of what what Kathy reported out, uh, but is also hitting on some of the same things. Yeah. Um, Barbara, can you say? Oh, go ahead, Eric. Did you have a follow up to that? No, I just said definitely. I de I agree. There's a lot of parallel yeah. with what Kathy said already. Great. Barbara, can you give a, a, a report out from the chronic pain and OUD breakout um, about the top points? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, our first uh, priority uh, is the step management, uh, medications management and step non-pharmacologic approaches, similar to what was uh, already discussed. And that would be for minimizing the effect or preventing the effect 
or preventing opioid use disorder, we discussed within that priority uh, having novel approaches with buprenorphine. So um, instead of just having buprenorphine available in OUD with the diagnosis, having it be more of a first line uh, or looking at it as a first line um, treatment. And then looking at optimizing pain treatment uh, with uh, buprenorphine uh, for OUD, looking at methadone as well as buprenorphine for chronic pain management. The second priority is non-pharmacologic and, and pharmacologic integrative approaches to trans transform care to have it be an easier approach, having it be more easier access uh, for patients um, and uh, by way of an adaptive uh, design for reimbursement of this, uh, these types of approaches for, um, for our patients. Then maximizing the ability to distinguish groups and tailor uh, treatment to those specific groups will help us to, to um, identify the groups as well as personalize the treatment plan and maximize their chance for success. Um, then liberalizing treatment policies to improve access, and that would be our infrastructure recommendations to recognize economic challenges, vulnerable populations, barriers to care, and try to help eliminate some of those barriers uh, to treatment. And those barriers um, are, are all inclusive, with including reimbursement as well. And then understanding technology, uh, telemedicine, other technology, uh, virtual reality, um, in uh, more intensive contact virtually uh, that we've learned with the COVID um, with the COVID pandemic. But especially given the need for ongoing monitoring in this population and embedding uh, this uh, in trials with multiple arms but the trials um, uh, are, uh, uh, would, uh, would be very complex, but um, uh, definitely something uh, to try. So in terms of our approach to the research, um, that is dependent on the question, of course, whether it's pragmatic. Um, safety was brought up uh, because these are interventions for our patients, so safety trials, um, smaller efficacy trials, um, um, and, and then uh, methods uh, in uh, second tier being the mechanistic um, studies embedded in the areas of the priority and then adaptive uh, trials as a research design. Um, and that, uh, that I believe is it. So I hope I- Okay, thanks so much. <laughs> Great. Okay, I'm gonna to try to, to um, uh, synthesize a bit, I think some of the, the common points I heard and also um, uh, some of the cross, the, the, the um, pieces that, that I think uh, multiple groups mentioned about, about tools and approaches that would be, um, uh, that would really move this uh, uh, Field forward quickly and in, in a way that would allow us to look at these, these broader cross cutting themes. So, um, I clearly heard across all of these groups that this, this work needs to be, be done in a way that is going to consider long term implementation and be sure that we're really including um, populations that are most impacted by this and sometimes get, get left behind. Um, Kathy mentioned um, uh, that their group really talked about being sure that, that you're working in settings where uh, there are most vulnerable populations are being treated and um, other groups talked about how to um, bring together, and this re reflects the theme from yesterday as well, um, these, these treatment approaches in, in a way that can be um, uh, that we consider the economic implications that we we make sure that they're they're put forth in a way that recognizes the reality of of some of the telehealth needs now um, and that uh, that we can also 
uh, look at these because there's, you know, I think as Eric nicely ar articulated, we don't know, we've looked at these things separately, but we don't know the value added in putting them together. So to do that in a very methodical way, and um, our group in particular, I know, talked about adaptive designs. And so how do you um, package these in ways that you might be able to uh, disaggregate, you know, some of these, these issues? Um, I heard a, a fair amount about measurement and how we consider measurement um, in, in, in ways that really build the foundation for doing this work, but also recognize where things are um, perhaps underdeveloped. Um, so Eric, you, you brought to the fore um, the idea of holistic measures and things that were, that were more patient-centered um, we talked in our group about um, some of the ways of, of doing things that were, um, that were tailoring treatment more, were understanding patients' values and maybe building that in in a more systematic way. I heard Kathy and her group saying that in starting this research and embedding um, some of these, uh, these constructs that, we're, 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 um, that can be useful for clinical care, but to do that in a routine way so that they can then be mined for research is, is a really important um, piece of this. Um, and then I wanted to recognize the overarching theme of stigma and how important that is to address um, from the get-go and to address not just in thinking about what patients experience, but how that gets deeply embedded into our care delivery systems. And when we think about these interventions, that there are things that are target, targeting our clinicians, but also the way that our systems are coming together and we need to think about um, uh, policy and, and, and regulatory mechanisms that have to do with stigma as well. Um, those are some cross-cutting themes. I think in the interest of time, we have about, we've got about 45 minutes and, I, and uh, I'd like to open it up to the broader group and, and get some initial thoughts about um, uh, where people see synergies, if there are gaps, so that we can, by the end of our 45 minutes, maybe come back around to trying to then synthesize and say what are the main points. And as um, Shelley reminded us, to, to really um, uh, leave our NIH co colleagues with what are the really important content domains um, that might be served by a variety of mechanisms. So let me stop there and um, uh, and, and invite a, a larger discussion. And I'm going to broaden my screen so hopefully I can see people's hands or just speak out if not. And if I'm going in and out at all, please let me know and I'm going to ask then somebody else to step in and, and co-facilitate. <clears throat> Reflections? Well, this is Kathy and I'll just start out by saying I think that Eric's group's recognition of the need for a holistic composite, it sounds like, outcome is critical. And we did not talk about that, um, but I think I just wanted to voice it would be a critical part of all the things we talked about and have. And so I just, I, that really resonated with me. And I, and I really want to just yeah. emphasize very briefly that, that again, what you said, Lynn, that we, just because we, we know efficacious interventions for pain and we know efficacious interventions for addiction doesn't mean that those interventions will be efficacious for the patient who has both of these issues, as well as the intersecting comorbidities. So we can move to pragmatic trials, but we, we, we shouldn't just be studying the same old interventions over and over again. You know, let me be the stupid doctor in the room and just say that if we always test every intention in different populations with based on all of their co-conditions, we would never practice medicine. And so I, I, I hear where that's coming from, but it runs counter to everything we've talked about in the last couple of days in terms of the underlying substrate of these. So while I think it's important, I will just a, a 
I was surprised at that price from a very uh, concrete medical implementation background. <laughs> so I just wanted to Although, put Kathy, that I out there. Ask, I, I would like to ask you about that because you would as a physician, and again, I'm not one, um, I would assume that we have efficacious treatments for cardiac disease, we have efficacious treatments for liver disease, but there's not necessarily an overlap between that you'd treat that same patient, just keep throwing more meds at them to treat, and you'd use the exact same medications to treat somebody that has comorbid cardiac and liver disease. Is that correct? Well, we always take you know, so no, the cardiac meds will affect the liver and they might be metabolized by the liver. And there's, you know, so we, we, we talk about the intersection all the time. And I think that's true in psychology too. I, I just think to me, it, it feels a little reductionistic to say that we have to have a whole new intervention in the overlap. And, and it's not that there might not be subgroups. That's why we need to study subgroups. I just, it's, it's a particular subgroup that I, I'm just surprised that it would be one third of the priorities. I mean, and, and that's just my bias. I just wanted to put it out there just because other people might, might resonate with that. I, I'm totally willing to let go of it. I'm, I'm yeah, not Bob, I'll just make a comment that, so I, I think this is a very important issue and it, in some ways, I do think that some of it does tie down to uh, lead to, I thought one part of what you were saying, Kathy, maybe this was your main point, is the measurement. What are we measuring? Bob, what's the can outcome? you get closer? We can't really hear you. What's the, what's yeah. the uh, measure? What's the outcome? And um, in the context of recent, it's old news, but it's recent. It's about functioning or something about well-being. Um, I'd say functioning as a behaviorist. Um, early on in my career, we developed, worked on developing a method, method for soliciting, eliciting uh, patient-driven value goals, objectifying those behaviorally smart goals, measuring them for a person, and then using that as an outcome measure in a pain clinical trial that we published in 1986. It's, it hasn't been really uh, something that's permeated the field uh, more broadly. And I do think that um, focusing on patient development of a, a patient-centered approach to outcome measurement for the person with all these conditions um, really is an important area for uh, exploration. Um, a single tool that we could use, perhaps integrated into the electronic health record, for example. It's it maybe a little more time-consuming, but it's you know, something that's patient driven, that's valued, and um, captures, you know, their, their personal goals, which are person by person, but somehow can be aggregated across people. That is so, I've been trying to get my team to do that for years, Bob, in substance use disorders, and I think it would work really well in our around substance use too. And I really like that. It's not what I thought Erica was saying, but I, I agree with that. Can, you know, so I've just a point of clarification. Yeah, I've shared this tool a lot and people say, oh, that looks great. And then it doesn't go anywhere. Um, I, I do think, um, you know, not to pitch our research, but I do think um, or that I've developed the, the solution but I do think this is critical, right? As long as we keep measuring pain or even pain interference, um, alcohol symptom severity, anxiety symptom severity, the drive and research to have a primary outcome, uh, you know, unless we have something that's meaning, a single measure that's meaningful for people with all this stuff, um, I think we're obstructing advancing our science. So just a point of clarification, um, I don't know, Bob, whether you were in Eric's group or Eric in the, the discussion, because it sounded like this was a big uh, point of discussion, whether it, there were other nuances to this holistic outcome, but I, but I, would, I would love to hear um, you or somebody from your group maybe say a little bit more and how that fits with what Bob's saying or, or might expand it, expand it in a different direction.
Could you uh, hear that? I take that on. This is Dan, because I think I was the one that mentioned it. So I totally agree. I, I wish more people were using the kind of outcomes that Bob um, suggested, because I think they really would be very helpful, um, not just in the pain field, but in other fields. And I think they would serve as a, potentially serve as a source of motivation for our patients, because they're defining what they think is most important and what they most want to improve from a functional standpoint. Um, I just typed a comment though that said that the problem is that if you don't, and, and I'm not talking about funding mechanisms or anything, but if you don't, if, if, what, if however you solicit proposals for something like this, if you don't clearly indicate that um, you want people to innovate vis-a-vis -vis adaptive study designs, vis-a-vis -vis, um, different ways of measuring primary outcomes, like looking at the proportion of people that you approach that actually participate in the study as a primary outcome. If you don't a priori say that, they, that you want that, then in regular, the regular peer review process, that type of stuff really fares poorly. So I, again, I know we're not supposed, I'm not trying to talk about, you know, funding, specific funding mechanisms, but I think the NIH people on the call need to be mindful of the fact that um, if you put those types of innovative designs or outcomes or things in and they're reviewed side to side with some, someone that uses a, a little bit more standard approach, uh, in many cases that, the, the more standard approach gets a better score and moves forward. So I think that we need to be mindful of that. Good point. Uh, Stefan, I, I saw that you made a comment about how this kind of a measure might play out and manifest and just wondered if you wanted to say a little bit more to what you'd said in the chat box there. Yeah, and this amplifies what Dan uh, said is that a patient's functional outcome is extremely important. Um, I wrote in the chat box that if my patient says, I want to get a job and get back together with family, and they actually do those things, I don't care that much about the PEG-3 score at that point. Um, I'm very aware that when we think about research, it is hard to power or to write a power section <laughs> for the attainment of goals that were highly relevant to the patient. But that is you know, that's a bridge I would like to cross uh, because moving a person's life forward is the ultimate thing you want to do. So emphasis on rehabilitative goals is important to patient and family. It seems to me where the science should go. Um, and then we're going to have a challenge about how to write our power sections. Right. Great comments. Um, John, I see your hand up. Do you have some comments about this domain? Um, yeah, I, <clears throat> I think measurement is is a key part of uh, all the study of, of of any disease, including these. And I completely agree with what Bob and Dan Claw were just saying, which is that uh, a, a patient focused uh, outcome measure that is uh, normalized in some way with a form or other ways is uh, is an important outcome to to have, in fact, uh, I had done some research on this, or at least tried to get a study uh, funded with this uh, many years ago, which, as Dan commented, was not funded. I, I would make one comment about what Dan had said, which is that if you put it in not as the primary outcome, but as the measure of overall quality of life or overall patient satisfaction, uh, then it can go in as a secondary measure. And if we do it several times, perhaps we'll have data to support its use as primary. I wanted to go to, to jump to, or not to jump, but to also comment about the measurement component at the beginning of studies. Um, and um, as um, I, I think perhaps Eric said, or, or somebody was talking about the need um, to consider the patient uh, and what's best for the patient uh, in the process of the studies that we do. And in order to do that, we really need to understand uh, <clears throat> whether there are subgroups of patients that do better with certain kinds of interventions than others. Um, and the, you know, the simple ones could be, you know, the degree of OUD and the amount of chronic pain or a bunch of things. But we ought to not forget that, there, that in most diseases, the response to any given therapy is on the order of 40%. 
it's very rare that there's a higher response. The only one that comes to mind is infectious disease, if you know what the sensitivity is. And so we need to be very careful about how we look at patients at the beginning, phenotyping them well and measuring within the realm of, of a reasonable number of questions what their uh, situation is so that we can then go back to, in those studies and understand which group of patients benefit from which kinds of therapies. If we don't do that, then we end up with just effect sizes and you know what's the effect size in this particular group. And they're very often uh, not overly large and we, we aren't sure uh, how best to advise our colleagues in terms of therapy of patients. Yeah, thanks for broadening that. So I, I see four folks with their hands up. So I think before we leave this outcomes and, and measurement domain, I'm assuming it's around that. Let's try to keep them somewhat brief, but, but, but I want to call on folks. So I see Katie's got her hand up. Okay. Katie, do you have a comment about this? Yeah, really quickly. I just wanted to further state about the, the making sure that we're not in our silos, so you know that we're measuring across domains, even if our particular project is is focused on one particular patient population that we're still measuring, um, so that we can glean information about how these interventions are effective for different populations. But I also wanted to, it's, it's one thing that came up in our group that I haven't heard yet, which is to broaden the focus beyond just healthcare and to consider um, how some of these ideas would also translate into other settings. And I, I'm sorry that I don't remember who brought that up in our group, but we, we made the comments around prisons and schools and workforce settings and, and how we, we've been so kind of focused in, in healthcare settings, but um, we can move beyond that. Great, and I heard Beth say that yesterday as well. Um, AJ, you've had your hand up. Um, yeah, so I wanted to, a uh, couple things. One thing is I wanted to circle back to Eric's comment and just say that I think it, that he and his group are right on the money. I completely agree because um, I think one of the big gaps is that we don't have enough treatment effectiveness studies, and I'm distinguishing those from pragmatic trials, effectiveness studies specifically in patients with chronic pain and these comorbidities. And, you know, he, I think they're right that the study has been done in primarily a pain population or primarily an OUD population. And uh, if you focus on the effectiveness studies, you can actually incorporate many of these unique and innovative um, measurement tools, as well as outcomes that you want to define. And it's a good place to do it because it's this intermediate step between the explanatory trial and the pragmatic trial. And, and I kind of made a big point in our group that I think going to pragmatic trials is actually jumping the gun, that we're putting the cart ahead of the horse because of the dearth of evidence that um, is out there scientifically. And I think the other groups have picked up on that. So thanks. Great, important point and an integrate slots. Yeah, Jessica. Sorry, I had to unmute there. Um, so I, there's been a little bit of a conversation going on in the chat box about this as well. And I, I think my concern here is that if you have somebody with a substance use disorder, and they also have pain, I would hope that the intervention for the substance use disorder wouldn't be devalued just because they have pain or else that intervention for a substance use disorder is not particularly robust and it was perhaps developed in one of these studies we've talked about as somebody in our group said of unicorns of people who you know just have one problem so i think um you know just have substance use disorder and nothing else so i i think what we really want to move to right is developing interventions that are robust enough and we already have you know, taking things that we already have that we know work really well, um, because we do have those things, and figuring out innovative ways to combine them and test them more broadly, I think is really important. But I, and it's not to say that there can't be innovation in novel behavioral techniques, but I, I don't think that where we really ought to be spending our time is more efficacy studies or more development of interventions that, um, don't build on the robust literature that we already have. And you know, there's, I, if, I, if anybody else wants to jump in, there was some robust back and forth in the uh, chat box about this, but. Um, I, I'd be happy to chime in if that's okay. Um, I, I was saying in the chat that um, I think that there, there's definitely room for innovation, but 
we, we simultaneously do need to move forward with implementation with um, efficacious treatments. What we know though is that there's continual barriers to patient engagement, and this gets back um, to Dan's really important comment that we really need to be studying um, this engagement issue so that we're sure that we're meeting patients where they are with what they want and with what works. Um, fundamentally, we need to be addressing access so that the treatments, we're, maybe we're adapting treatments, we're translating them into accessible formats, um, delivering them in accessible ways. Um, but our primary issue is access and, and still, you know, need for innovation. So I think these concepts can coexist, um, but the access issue is primary. Great. Thank you. That's a nice, nice compliment to what, what others are saying here and how these things can, can be melded together, um, short of getting too far in the continuum one place or another. Joanna has patiently had her hand up. So, Joanna, I wanted to uh, be sure you uh, were, were able to chime in. Sure. It's quick. Just on the composite outcome question, I agree with um, patient-directed goals as a great um, it's a little hard to see as we talked about. Another idea is a composite measure that's similar to in the sickle cell field. There's a measure called the ask me and it it's a scale, um, it's not perfect, but incorporates physical health, pain, social um, and mental health as well. And it is geared for a population who has chronic pain and flares of their chronic pain. So it's worth looking at and considering if we want to use um, something like that in pain research. Great, great. Um, I'm, th th thank you, and that would be great to have you circulate that, because um, I think it really does uh, speak to some of the questions here. Um, I'm also hearing things about gold pain and scaling kinds of, uh, you know, potentially um, ways of bringing patients more eographic, uh, you know, values and things forward and how we might measure that. A number of good comments on that. I'm going to shift us a little bit, unless Eric or Stefan, you have a very quick comment that is that is about this, just in the interest in time and trying to co cover a couple of the other big domains. But quick comments. Uh, just to, uh, I'm not. Um, go ahead. Go ahead, Stefan. Stefan. On the on the issue of access, the if um, I'll emphasize that the partners who pay and reimburse and regulate have a, a big role to play in what we make accessible. So if we have something we like and we develop it in a way that involves understanding closely from US Drug Enforcement Agency or from CMS, how it fits into their paradigms, that increases the chances that it can be made accessible and that providers will feel comfortable engaging and offering that treatment. I think that's a part of the access equation. Really great point. And I, you know, I just wanted to say to that, we, you know, part of what was brought up is stakeholder involvement. We've talked a fair amount about patients, but maybe to very systematically be involving this broader group of stakeholders uh, for the very reasons you bring up. Um, Eric, quick comment before we shift gears a little bit. Just that, uh, the issue of innovation that that gets that gets integrated into uh, models of care approach. So we're not talking about uh, necessarily efficacy trials, uh, you know, two arm parallel efficacy trials here, but but adaptive designs that that, that allow for novel intervention components uh, that integrate the advances in behavioral science and neuroscience that have been developed in the past decade or two. Um, I think that's where the innovation can fit in into into this because it really is all about access to care. So how do we how do we build care pathways? Great. Okay, and I think we'll look back around about that. One thing I realized I forgot to mention that was a common theme and wanted to get folks uh, input on this is in thinking about um, opportunities to to jointly uh, treat pain and OUD. 
we, we certainly, buprenorphine is a big focus of treatment for medication for OUD, but there was a lot of discussion in our group, and I heard it echoed in some of the others, that maybe we're not optimizing how that, that care could be delivered for folks with pain. And I wanted to just at least briefly get folks' thoughts about that because it, it was a, an area of synergy and, and a, a place where that might be more evident. Jessica, I saw you shake your head and maybe you can comment first. Yeah, I mean, I have so many thoughts on this, but mainly, yes. Um, you know, I think that this has a lot to do with the big question of how we provide care to individuals with pain and OUD and where that care is provided. So, I mean, getting broader availability of buprenorphine for this purpose and putting that tool in the toolbox of primary care physicians, um, I think we'd go a really long way towards accomplishing this. Um, I see this as something that would work really well in primary care settings because primary care docs, as Joanna very nicely stated yesterday, um, are the ones who treat pain. They're also to a large degree um, where OUD treatment is moving. And so um, so I see that as a really important um, for the but right now we don't have sort of a home for these individuals, um, but I see primary care as, as you know. Okay, great. Joanna? Yeah, I also have a lot of thoughts and agree that context is important. Another piece that's important to expanding how we use buprenorphine for chronic pain is our formulations that are available and dosing that's available because we have the FDA approved transdermal, which is for chronic pain, but the sublingual and now the injectable are for OUD. It doesn't really make sense, right? It's the same medication. And then there is a jump between what dose is available sublingual, which is much lower doses than what's available um, in transdermal versus what's available with sublingual, which is a much higher dose. And there's a gap. Like you can't cut a sublingual small enough to fill the gap between a transdermal <laughs> And so it just doesn't make sense. So to try to think about more rational ways that we can optimize buprenorphine delivery, both pharmacologically, you know, and also in delivery of care. Okay, great. Good point. Jessica, I'm going to quickly, because it looked like you had a direct response to that and then go to Dan. That made me think of um, something related, which is, and this may be controversial, but um, methadone. So I think, at least in the sort of cancer pain and palliative care world, people for a long time have been grappling with how to use methadone in ways that I think we really don't understand, like ways to, you know, methadone to treat both pain and OUD in palliative care in oncologic settings. And I think we could all agree that there are probably safety issues associated with that. But I think maybe broadening this question out a little bit instead of just buprenorphine, but you know, how can we use medications to treat OUD in settings where our patients are? Um, and that definitely includes bupe, but also, but also methadone. Okay, thanks. Well, let me just add Dan? that before we move oh, on, um, Lynn, is I think for bupe, I, I see methadone is not that safe a drug due to cardiovascular stuff, but, the, but for bupe, I think we need to study it in high-risk populations, high-risk for suicide, high-risk due to other substance use, and that we really need to study, um, there just need to be trials of those, these different high-risk populations. Thanks. Yeah, so, yeah, I just wanna support everything that's being said. As someone who studies the neurobiology of pain and, and how opioids play a role, um, we, our group and others think that um, bup would actually be a great drug for centralized or nosoplastic pain because of the mm. opioid antagonist properties. And we're not surprised that, you know, people find that it is helpful in subsets of patients in whom a, a pure mu opioid would not be effective. And so the NIH needs to realize that there's no drug company right now that would be financially incented to do the important studies that need to be done about how to optimally use bup, either in chronic pain alone um, in conditions like fibromyalgia or at the intersection of chronic pain and OUD. Those studies, because there's no patent protection for any company um, that I could ever see, um, are not going to be done by a drug company. So it, it really is an area where the NIH could be really helpful. 
great point. Thank you so much. Um, I, I'm going to go to Beth, who's who's had her hand up, but I'm also going to suggest, and I, I'm looking to Eric as well, that that one of the places, uh, looking that we're at 10, I know we, we have to end this, or 1 o'clock if you're East Coast, um, this discussion in, in 15 minutes, but is a, was, is a really important area, is how we bring in the, the non-pharmacotherapy uh, uh, kinds of treatments, where do we do those in conjunction with these pharmacotherapy things? How do we think about the overall designs and, and best to your points earlier about access and engagement? So that may not be what you were prepared to talk about, but I'm gonna turn to you next to, to maybe start us on that conversation. I think you're on mute still. You're talking, but we can't hear you. Okay, sorry. Right. No, um, I, you know, Dan's points were well taken on on the BUP. I guess you know my concern is just um, maybe an over focus on on the medication per se, and needing to, for us to question whether the focus is on safety or really efficacy. And um, so I, I, I just have concerns there. Is it? You know, we do need more studies, certainly, but I just hope that that doesn't become an overfocus. And Lynn, did you task me with transitioning to a different topic? Uh, I suggested if you have comments about the non-pharmacotherapy and you brought up patient engagement and how we might, in a, a more specific, look at and address that as well. Yeah, um, I, I'm not sure I have much more to add to it. Um, I was really following up on what I thought was an incredibly insightful comment by Dan is that um, when we're conducting our research, um, we fail to engage so many people. And so this is where the pragmatic trials is particularly useful um, because we're studying people in real clinical settings and the extent to which we can remove this overlay of what we're really studying is people who engage in research um, and not necessarily who engages in the day-to-day. -day. And so there's that limited translation. Um, but I think that topic's been well covered. I'd like to okay. uh, follow up. Um, I'm actually going to... Okay. Be, uh, because you you invoked me and my, <laughs> and my hand was raised. Um, I, I do think that th taking the example of bup or, or methadone, uh, bridging it to, to my comments on day one, uh, when you, there, there's some beginning uh, basic neuroscience research that is showing that bup and methadone, not only do they not treat the reward deficit that is integral to both chronic pain and opioid use and misuse, but there's some evidence that it actually may worsen the reward deficit. Uh, and that, whether that has to do with the agonist properties of these medications or not, I don't even think we know the answer to that yet. But so certainly if they don't treat the reward deficit, then this, here's where other interventions are needed. And potentially, for example, mm -hmm. here's, a, here's a role that non-pharmacological therapies can play. For example, mindfulness-based therapies to enhance reward responsivity, to teach people how to cultivate a sense of healthy pleasure, joy, and meaning in life, et cetera. So, and that, and this feeds back to the conversation about innovation and also uh, the need for a multi-component intervention. So uh, if we're gonna get, for example, if we're gonna give BUP, we ought to be giving it with an intervention that can also address the reward deficit Okay, great. So, so, so that was my follow-up is, is that you're 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 still suggesting doing those in a in a, um, a, a a way that you might combine them, but the thinking about the pathways uh, underneath the the actions of both, and maybe the ability to look further at some of these mechanisms. Exactly, with embedded within an adaptive uh, design, research design. Yeah. So um, not to put others on the spot, but I'm thinking about Julie and Amy that we haven't heard from in this broader discussion, and uh, both of you who are very active in, in researching non-pharmacotherapy approaches, and just wonder if you have thoughts or comments about this or things that came up in your groups that you'd like to underscore. 
Uh, yeah, sorry, I've been, uh, I guess, more active on the chat than verbal, <laughs> verbally. Um, but I would, I would very much concur. I think, you know, what we're, with what we're seeing, you know, with the BUP and the methadone, um, and, and with what Eric was just saying, I, you know, we need to understand the basic underpinnings of the neuroscience. We need to understand the basic underpinnings of the psychophysiology and use that information to create better psychotherapy treatments. And this has always been the flag that I wave or the, um, that we need to make sure that there's a connection there between the biology and the psychology of, of what's happening. Um, and so there, there is some mechanistic pieces there, but also understanding the larger psychosocial area in which it is, or which the person exists, uh, including the stigma issues and uh, those other those other pieces that I'm, I am a little concerned. I mean, bup and methadone are great. Uh, I am concerned when that becomes the sole focus. Uh, even when we talk about farm versus non-farm yeah. interventions, we're talking about essentially two or three drugs versus everything else out there that's a non-farm intervention. Um, so when we're creating this pharmacological versus non-pharmacological treatment dichotomy, um, we're, we're talking about three drugs versus PT, OT, psychotherapy, psychosocial, stigma interventions. And, and I think that's a little unbalanced as far as um, how we want to make sure that we're approaching, if we're really going to approach the patient with a 360-degree uh, wellness as the outcome or a fully functional co component as an outcome, I think we really need to balance how we even conceptualize this and not just conceptualize as farm, non-farm, um, because that's just very unbalanced at this point. And it doesn't get at the heart of, of what needs to be fixed. We've tried that. That's what we've been doing for the past 20 years. Do something else. Right. We even need to conceptualize how we engage treatment, how we engage patients in that treatment in a different way. Yeah, that, I would really important. That I uh, you know, I, I think everything that we said to start out this conversation about medication-based treatments would apply with non-pharmaceuticals in terms of um, stepped and stratified and risk-based approaches and looking at different uh, subgroups of patients based on their phenotypes. But I think what Amy just said is really particularly critical to what I think is kind of at the core of what we're trying to do here, which is to integrate um, uh, more and create not only different ways to combine discrete treatment approaches, but to really study how treatments are provided in a truly multidisciplinary way um, where providers um, provide patients with a consistent message about what the goal of the intervention overall is. And I, you know, I think there's a, a good bit of opportunity and I um, in, in my world of non-pharmacologic care, we talk a lot about the common contextual factors, whether it's physical or psychological treatments that probably optimize an intervention regardless of whether you're doing CBT or an exercise-based approach or what have you. And um, that really goes to the engagement and the motivation of the patient, which um, uh, regardless of what the discrete intervention is. And this particular combination of comorbidity seems to be a place where that kind of approach to research um, might be particularly beneficial to focus a little bit less on the exact combination of modalities, but more on how they're provided, how they're presented to the patient, and how providers work together to do it. Terrific point. Yeah. Let me, let me just um, add Bob, one a, to that, which is patient preference in here that we haven't talked about, so that as we're blending all these things, that, that the key in the real world is patient preference, and, and, and it relates to engagement. I want to just get that on the map as we close. Thank you. Uh, Bob, it looks like you had a, a follow on comment to this thread. Yes, thank you. Um, I was impressed with a review that was commissioned uh, by David Atkins and HSRD. It's led by a group that uh, uh, conducted an evidence synthesis review of models of care, pain care, um, that really identified. Um, Care coordination of and a few and for three other dimensions is key, but I want to focus on this idea of engagement and care coordination and the concept of integration. It's not so much to me that it needs, it's about, you know, an ally in the healthcare setting, if we're talking about healthcare delivery, an ally for the patient who can serve to um, help develop the a patient center plan help the patient navigate 
the enactment of that plan, retain retention in the plan. We might think this is the role of a primary care provider in many settings. It's just more than is reasonable to be done. And in VA and in other settings, of course, we're talking about teams, patient-centered medical homes. I do think an area for research is to uh, zoom in and explore a little more about how this can actually get done in a way that really is patient-centered and effective. Um, and um, I, I think that's a, an important gap here. You know, we, we do have a, a menu of options. They're low, sm small to moderate effects. Uh, maybe the goal ultimately is precision, you know, pain care and able to match patients with the right treatment. But in the meantime, I think we could do better by advancing science on um, this process of engagement and coordination, integration of care to do something in the context of a, you know, United States where I have to say politically, we don't have a healthcare system. We, 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 yeah. you know, it's, it's a bunch of pieces. So, you know, yeah. in the VA, it's hard for a veteran uh, to navigate everything they have to navigate, especially with all these disadvantages and comorbidities. So focusing there a little bit, I think would be uh, a great benefit. Terrific, and I think that 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 actually corresponds nicely to points Kathy made early on about thinking about implementation pieces and and ways that we can actually study some of the processes and coordination that you're talking about. Chris, I saw your hand go up and then down and up, and you haven't had a chance to speak, so um, would love to hear your thoughts about this. Sure, I mean I completely agree with Bob, and we talked about this in our group. Um, you know, we're never going to be able to study every single treatment for every single pain condition, plus or minus every other comorbidity that we're talking about here. So really, what we need to do is establish a framework, a structure, models of care um, that would allow us to, you know, to study and implement all of these important research research questions. Is this combined with that going to be more effective than this and that for this population? But until we you know, systematically have that framework or these interdisciplinary care teams or models, we're never going to be able to conduct those types of that type of research effectively and be able to translate it across other, um, you know, other care systems. Because as we know, this is few and far between across the country. And I would just add to that that, you know, some of these trials are being done through PCORI, which is great, um, but unfortunately, PCORI, PCORI doesn't allow you to measure cost. Um, and that is a key component to this because until we systematically measure outcomes as well as cost, we're not going to be able to get payers to change what they're doing because it's, it, it's expensive for them to do that. Um, I had put my hand up and down earlier. I just wanted to make a comment in regards to non-pharmacologic care. And this has been discussed over and over again at meetings through the last few years um, with the National Academies and others, is that what's happening kind of on the ground level for patients and seeking non-pharmacologic care is it's kind of like the wild, wild west. You know, there are no standards. Um, there's so many different modalities and methods to different practices. It's almost impossible to compare outcomes with meta-analysis because everybody is defining different non-pharmacologic treatments differently. Um, their outcomes are different. And I would just make a plea to the leaders in that community that we really need to develop standards, definitional standards for what is exercise therapy. How many times a week do you have to do this? For how long? At what frequency and what duration and so on and so forth. And it applies to multiple different types of acupuncture and different types of massage because as a patient, it's very, very difficult to know how long should I be doing this? What type should I be doing with? What type of provider should I be doing this with? Be able to make you know, decisions about whether it's effective or not effective. Um, and, and we really need that from the highest levels to you know, come down. Good point, okay. Um, just if there are a couple of other comments about these uh, uh, higher systems level, I know Stefan, you've talked, you talked about that earlier and you've had your hand up. Did you wanna make a a comment about that well i i my comment on the systems level stuff is already in your notes i just want to emphasize okay. the far opposite end which is the natural environment and this came up 
in the question of not wanting to just study people who enter studies where we manage to control all variables and have very valid comparisons, but uh, they're not highly generalizable. Patients in the alcohol use disorder research, natural remission and the processes by which people enter care is, is the key. Uh, so I, I, I and this Dan's cautionary comments on this are very important, but nonetheless, when people set goals that are spurred by their environment, or by the people they care about, those things often spur successful recovery from pain or from addiction, including engagement. So systematic attention to the environmental context that lead to taking advantage of a service or engaging with it successfully is something we should be able to attend to. And that it could include measuring social support, it could include measuring declared reasons and firmness of commitment to engaging in a process. Uh, and it, that process might be taking buprenorphine. Uh, but whatever it is, those things are often factored out as nuisance variables when in fact they are central to driving the outcome. So I think they can be systematically attended to. Okay, great point. And I think um, uh, you know w one of the things that's, that's clear about these is that, that some of the things that we've used to really maximize internal validity and, and keep designs clean are things we need to tackle uh, really systematically and, and keep our inclusion broad and, and really be able to study some of these factors. Um, AJ, uh, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. I wanted to um, say I completely agree with Chris's point and I want to extend it. I think it's so important. I think in pain implementation research, there isn't enough of it, but what's been there has really been missing this, this combination of, of three elements to make it effective on a healthcare systems level. So one, obviously you gotta have improvement in pain care. Two, you gotta be able to show that costs are saved. This could be downstream costs like preventing emergency department visits or, in, or hospitalizations with some cost savings. And three is some new revenue generation. It's that trifecta, that's what's needed to actually make healthcare system change. You can argue it's overkill. You should only need one of those three, right? But the sad fact is I think our healthcare systems, especially in, in the civilian world, not necessarily the VA world, but the civilian world really function on those three pillars. Um, and I think if we can articulate that as a group, that in the implementation science, that's a gap, that would really help. Because exactly as Chris said, despite all these beautiful PCORI studies, we, we've all been limited by cost that we can study in, this, in the study. So that's a huge area to contribute. Great, so, and that came up across across the the, the um, studies. So I'm looking at the time. And we're actually a couple of minutes over where we were supposed to be this discussion. I, I I one wanted to just appreciate how rich this discussion has been, and they you know how much I've seeded by the the breadth of experience people are bringing to this, and really have dove in to uh, to think about things at a, you know, a deep level scientifically, but also within this broader context and, and pragmatic envelope. Um, Shelly or others, are there anything else that you, because I know you were good about pointing us back to really the questions you needed answered and our focus that you'd like in comment from the group before we shift to um, any closing comments um, on the NIH side? I think Leslie was going to say something. I, I just want to echo, like, this is my first virtual meeting since COVID, and I am so impressed with the level of engagement and thoughtfulness. I mean, I think that this, it shows me, gives me hope that as COVID continues, we can still do the important work that we need to do from a virtual space. So I really thank you for all of your attention and, and insight. Yeah, this is Leslie, and I, I just want to say, wow, I mean, this has been a terrific uh, discussion, and we have lots to chew on um, here. So uh, there's nothing, you know, additional that, uh, Lynn, that we need to discuss right now. This has tr been terrific. Yeah. So I, I guess one thing that I would like to ask, um, those of you from NIH and just uh, uh, invite maybe the group to go to do if, um, if if relevant. I think people have mentioned different tools they've used, you know, um, key citations that might drive this. Um, I think maybe uh, as we're reflecting on this rapid two days um, to create some repository that that um, that informs the discussion we've had. Um, if if we could invite people to submit some of that, I think 
um, that would be useful. Uh, because we just, I, I, I think we, uh, we have very rich discussion, but it wasn't as much time as needed for this. Um, uh, other, particularly folks that haven't had a, you know, chance maybe to, to be as active in this end discussion, um, uh, if, if we don't have more comments from the NIH group, I'm just wondering if we might have a few more minutes of people just distilling uh, you know, kind of final uh, recommendations and takeaways. I know, Kathy, you had your hand up and just would invite others, particularly if you haven't had a chance to, to weigh in. And Barbara as well, You, I shifted by you when I was um, uh, asking to distill things. So Kathy and then, then Barbara. Um, I put my comments into the chat. I think the, the one thing I would say at the end of the day is that what pain and substance use and mental health share is an engagement problem often, and that we really have to keep, so often the denominator is missing from studies and the whole what percentage of people come in. And, and I really, um, the other thing I put into the chat, which I think relates is what Stefan just said, which is so important. And that is that um, what makes people pro engage is important. And we've talked about making an outcome that's related to what is motivating patients, but that could also be the baseline variable could be a covariate of that outcome and we need to, to look at that. And the final thing, I is, which I think is actually critical, um, is it's not just about cost in health systems. I mean, I've been in the VA and I've been in Kaiser now. It's actually about patient satisfaction and provider satisfaction. And both of those play key roles. And so we have to think about those stakeholders and designing things they want. Um, both parties, I think, is important. Great point. Barbara? Yeah, I'd like to talk uh, about the infrastructure for a minute uh, regarding communication. You know, we find that for those of us that are in the clinical realm that medical, electronic medical records were to be the panacea for us to be able to communicate. And we really do find an absence of information about uh, opioid use disorder in our medical records or that it's stated incorrectly or, or um, otherwise. And so research is very difficult when we want to access the electronic medical record for that information. It's very difficult to access it and to get an idea or, or actually to have um, some of the measurement tools uh, in there is, is also not there. The other thing I'd like to mention is regarding the big global databases uh, that are available is um, understanding that they do not really reflect what's happening on an individual level. And uh, making sure that uh, large data sets, uh, you know, I don't know if, they, if, they, if they can even do that, is to have more of a, uh, a personal information access on those databases so that, uh, so that that information's not lost. The other thing is um, many of our patients can be lost to follow up on, on studies and, and also in patient care as well. And so we need to do some work on that loss of, of follow up, um, both clinically as well as with research. And that's what I have. Thanks. Great. Great, and uh, you know, I think that that question about loss to follow up is is really connected to many's comments about engagement and how core that is up front. Um, also, just um, uh, be provocative and and say that Kathy and Katie and I are are are, are um, collaborating on a study where we're using a Zellin design so that we're actually studying that broader population. Um, that don't are not necessarily consenting to trials that are, are randomized pre-consent, but it requires the kind of outcomes that are routinely collected to do that. So that's that's another approach. Um, so we are we are winding down, but Ingrid, I'm going to give you so you've had your hand raised, maybe the last word, and then just summarize briefly uh, before we end today. All right, that that's a little. <laughs> I hate to be the one with the last word, but I will, um, I'm going to probably express this improperly, but I, I just want to be a little cautious. I guess one note of caution is some of this discussion about sort of this dichotomy between psychological or, you know, behavioral interventions and um, 
medication intervention scares me a little bit because I think it's the way that my patients often enter treatment is they think they have to choose between those two. And naturally, most of them prefer non-pharmacologic treatment. I mean, my impression is that if I followed what my patients wanted, I would predominantly be referring them for non-medication treatment. But the mortality rates are so incredibly high. And I would love to get all my patients off of medications, but the mortality rates are so high in this population. And I've seen such disastrous, tragic outcomes that I guess I just want to make sure that we aren't sort of reinforcing this potential dichotomy and that we're sort of blending all of the tools we have available to us um, to treat these incredibly high risk patients. So maybe that's just my last word on that. Yeah. And I think that that's very helpful, and, and I, I see that as akin to some of what Amy brought into the discussion a, a bit ago and others about talking about this overall um, um, coordination so that, it's, that we are very careful about that languaging and we look at these processes of care and not assume it's one or the other, but maybe also, as Eric said, that, that different pieces of these have uh, maybe different mechanisms of action, and can we can we can study that? And Ingrid, I think as you rightfully brought up in our group, thinking about the safety profiles of of the of the treatments, but also for our patients um, who are, are are really at very very high risk, especially when we're talking about these vulnerable populations, and 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 how we we may sequence these. Um, so we're going to end on as equally a complicated note, I guess, as we started. I think that there were some very important common themes that came out in this this last discussion, um, and uh, I, you know, I wanted to to underscore uh, the pieces about the the breadth of our our, our measurement uh, to not lose sight of of being able to look at the component pieces, but to look also holistically. And, and to um, be able to not um, uh, exclusively and, and, and look to Ingrid's cautions, but, but look at patient values as driving at least the, the narrative and the, and we didn't talk a lot about shared decision making, but, but the way that these, these various treatments are brought together um, in a way that engage patients. But also I, I, I really heard, and I don't think we got as, had as much chance to talk about it, is how we may really uh, be able to use adaptive design and, and, and by those so doing really consider some of these things simultaneously. So if you have further thoughts, recommendations um, for NIH or to share with one another, I really um, uh, encourage follow-up because I think sometimes it's just as we distill these in the days afterwards that things start, start to crystallize and, and hope that can be um, you know, added to the repository of um, uh, the outcomes from this uh, terrific workshop. So thanks so much to our sponsors and for everyone for your, your really active involvement and uh, would echo, I'm not sure my speed worked as well as others, but, but how well this worked virtually, um, although it would have been nice to, to be together in person uh, to do this, so maybe at some point. Thanks everybody. Hi. Thank you to all the sponsors. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I, this is Leslie, and I just, Lynn, thank you for a great job facilitating, and thank you all participants. I mean, it has been a truly rich discussion and hugely appreciated. I also want to thank our um, contractor, uh, Synergy Enterprises, Inc., who have done a terrific job making this virtual meeting a success as well. Um, I just wanted to let you know that we will have a workshop summary that will be um, available, that will be available along with the recording um, on the HEAL website. We will move, um, hopefully be able to move the uh, different articles that were suggested pre-meeting over to that HEAL website as well. Um, we sent an email out yesterday requesting um, permission to also post PDFs of your slides. So if you have any concerns about that, please let Jana or I know. Um, and um, if there are additional things that you would like to share with us or links or something, we've captured the chats again. Um, as Lynn said, we can make that resource you know, available. So again, all this will be eventually accessible via the HEAL website. So thank you all very much. Leslie.
Yes. Will we be able to reflect on this? So we have some terrific members of the HEAL multidisciplinary working group who took part in this meeting. And that was really the origin of the concept, recognizing that some of the first phase HEAL projects were not represented in 2019, that, that were represented in 2019, could be expanded with the types of research we discussed today or over the past two days. So we'll be able to discuss this when the multidisciplinary working group meets again. Thanks, Rebecca. And that was Rebecca Baker, who's the director of HEAL.